Okay, so another area where you might want to be using labor market diagrams is in a question on trade unions and wages and also the impact of unions on employment. So using labor demand and supply diagrams, uh, how can we analyze the impact of trade union collective bargaining on wages and jobs? Collective bargaining is when unions together negotiate with employers over wages and other employment terms and conditions, including things like pensions and health and safety. Trade union membership in the UK has been in decline since the late 1970s. I just thought I'd give you a bit of a historical perspective to start with. This chart shows trade union membership in the UK since 1892. Wow. Uh, and it peaked basically at about 13 million in 1978-79. Uh, of course, Margaret Thatcher was elected in 79 and the following decade, there was a, a decade or more of trade union legislation which stripped away many of their legal powers to, to strike and take industrial action of different types. Union membership has been falling more or less continuously uh, ever since, not just to do with the employment legislation, to do with the changing labour market, changing uh, patterns of employment and things, the decline of heavy engineering, heavy industry, coal mining and what have you. Uh, and employment uh, in the UK is higher, 34 million, of which only about 6.5 million people are members of a trade union. In fact, the latest data which is good, good data to have available in your mind, is that uh, about 24-25% of uh, people in work are members of a trade union. So only one person in four is a member of a union compared to about 33, about a third back in 1995. So how do we use labour demand, demand and supply diagrams, pardon me, to illustrate the possible impact on uh, bargaining. So here's a situation where the labour demand curve is fairly elastic. It's wage sensitive. So employers are sensitive to the wage they pay with respect to the number of people they employ. I've drawn the labour supply curve as up and sloping and, and the wage is W1 in equilibrium. Well, trade unions in this situation have relatively limited bargaining power. And I'm going to assume that unionisation is low only a small percentage of people are members of a union, they might be able to negotiate the wage up to W2, but uh, one of the effects might be that, that employment falls from E1 to E2. So trade unions typically have less bargaining power when the demand for labour is wage elastic. And uh, when employers can oftentimes find non-union employees uh, if they need to, if they need to control wage costs. Now, in contrast, on the right-hand side, I'll put this diagram up. This time I've drawn the labour demand curve as inelastic. So therefore, the employer is uh, less likely to shed labour if wage costs go up. So again, at W1, the unions might be able to negotiate quite a high wage, W2. They lose some employment, but not as much. And you can see here that that big area above W1 to W2 is the extra income, the earnings that union employees might be able to negotiate. So typically unions are in a stronger bargaining position when labour demand is relatively inelastic. Of course, you can develop this diagram a little bit further. It may be the case that uh, high wages, union negotiated high wages, well above the, the normal equilibrium, if you like, could uh, act as a catalyst for some firms to say, well, we need to control costs here. Uh, we can't afford to pay these high wages uh, going forward. And we might bring, bring forward our own capital labour substitution. So that might prompt an increase in capital intensity of production, in which case the labour demand curve might shift to the left from LD1 to LD2, which means that that wage W2, there is now less employment than there was before. Again, what we're suggesting here for the exams is to try to develop your diagrams a little bit, just a little bit further, slightly more detailed diagrams, because that helps your analysis and it clearly prompts better evaluation. You know, the extent to which firms can shift uh, the most process of production away from labour towards, towards capital. That might be easy in retailing, where you can use self-scanning machines and sensors and things, uh, as Amazon are doing. But it's harder in social care, health and social care, where labour is, is an essential input into the production process. The premium that unions get, in other words, the gap between the average wage of a union member to a non-union member, that has come down again since 1995. Do you remember that union density was about 33%? The premium was pretty high as well, about 25%. So on average, a union member was getting 25% more pay than a non-union employee 
that has come down again over the years. In fact, in 2020, it was just now below 5%. So trade unions in the UK are getting one of the lowest wage premiums for many years. And that might indeed be a reason why union membership continues to stay low. We'll spend just a few minutes in the last video in this set looking at how you could use a labour market diagram to show zero hour contracts.